the trilogy was a very exhausting feat for Bergman, stretching over a full two and a half years. I think that he felt that he could abandon finally, or perhaps come to terms with the religious baggage of his past, because Bergman uh, was, of course, the son of a pastor, a minister, who rose to become the advisor to the queen in Sweden. And so he went around as a boy through these churches and was inured not only to religious practice, but to the very strict way of life that went with it. And he spent his early part of his life completely rebelling about, against this, but not being able to come to terms with it. And I think in the trilogy, he finally confronts these problems in a realistic setting that you and I can relate to. He actually said they should be regarded as a trilogy. They are a reduction in the metaphysical sense of the word. Through glass darkly is certainty achieved and winter light is certainty unmasked and the silence is really the silence of God and what he calls the negative impression. So make of that what you will, but I feel that he entered upon them uh, knowing they'd be a trilogy. Although these three films are very austere, severe, if you like, although they're very stark, although they're very spiritual in nature, um, I think that they do have uh, an immediate quality which enables us to relate to the characters in them. And part of that is due to the fact that for the first time, Bergman has reduced his cast. I think Bergman's interest in music at this time uh, prompted him to go for the chamber play or chamber cinema format. He's reduced his cast to just a handful of people interacting with each other, like the instruments in a string quartet or a quintet, really and uh, each plays off the other. So we get to know these characters possibly more than we do in some of the bigger canvas films of the 50s in Bergman's career, like Smiles of a Summer Night, which has all these wonderful people in it. But perhaps we're not so close to any single one of those as we get to uh, Thomas in Winter Light or Esther and Anna in The Silence or to uh, David and uh, Karin in Through a Glass Darkly. It was a very, very critical watershed in his life. He had, the previous year, married Cabilarite, his fourth wife. She is an Estonian concert pianist who has uh, had tremendous triumphs. Uh, she was a friend of uh, Bartok. She was a friend of Stravinsky, and Bergman met these people through her. He dedicated Through a Glass Darkly to her. And there are so many things in it which are musical. He, I think, renounced a lot of the uh, expressionism of the 50s that he'd been uh, known for, these very, very elaborate, strong effects in films like The Seventh Seal. I think it was a positive move, and a number of things came together that enabled him to achieve that. Number one, he decided to use Sven Nykvist as his cameraman. Gunnar Fischer, who we all know from the great films of the 50s, like Smiles of a Summer Night, Seventh Seal, Wild Strawberries and so on, uh, was working for Disney in early 59. And so Sven Nykvist was taken for the Virgin Spring. And Bergman was so impressed by his location filming for that picture that he decided to ditch Fisher. And there was quite a big row between them, a lot of ill feeling, because they'd been together since the 40s, Gunnar and Ingmar. And, um, uh, Sven Nykvist brought to Bergman's work uh, a clarity, uh, particularly in the outdoor scenes. He liked to use real light, whether it's the light of twilight or it's the light of dawn, whereas Gunnar Fischer was a master of the uh, studio lighting. So there was a big contrast there. And all of these three films instantly strike us by the uh, very realistic look of the cinematography. The next thing that happened uh, was that when they were scouting locations for Through a Glass Darkly, they went up to the north of Scotland and they thought they would find a place in the Orkneys and they didn't. And then someone suggested the island of Fora, just a little bit north of uh, Gotland, which was off limits for many, many years because it was used by the Swedish military. And they took a ferry across on a winter's day and it was pouring with rain, but he just fell in love with the landscape and the shoreline with its extraordinary rock formations. And 
he didn't move there for some years, but when he did go, he remained there for 30 years and he still lives there today. Uh, so he decided to use that as a location. And I think that, again, contributed enormously to this new look that we associate with the trilogy. Bergman won the second of his best foreign film Oscars for Through a Glass Darkly, following on Virgin Spring. And uh, I think that was probably the absolute apex of his career before those films came out. When they did come out, I think a lot of his regular admirers were rather shocked by the austerity of Through a Glass Darkly uh, and couldn't cope with it for a while. And admission numbers for those films dropped off a little and it wasn't until The Silence, which had some very controversial sex scenes in it, that those attendance figures started to mount again. But he was at his absolute peak, I would say, uh, at the turn of the year 1959-60. And so he was able to do pretty much what he wanted. He had complete freedom. Bergman announced that he was going to take a year off to study the music of Johann Sebastian Bach. Well, he never did, but he studied him anyway and has always been a real, really keen music follower and once said in an interview that had he not been a filmmaker, he would have liked to have been a conductor. Bach, I think, is particularly well used in the trilogy. It's used in Through a Glass Darkly with the, uh, with the D minor cello suite, which gives this wonderfully warm but also very isolated sound. Harriet Anderson gives one of the great performances in Through a Glass Darkly, as she would a decade uh, later in Cries and Whispers. She had had a very interesting career with Bergman. First of all, she had had a love affair with him in the early 50s. She'd made two terrific films with him, Summer with Monica and The Naked Night, where her real eroticism just comes right off the screen. She had no, none of the artificiality of early 50s heroines. But then she went off and married a farmer down in the south of Sweden and just vanished from the screen for some years. And Bergman took her back, as it were, some eight years later for Through a Glass Darkly. And, boy, she really lived that part, almost in a, to a method degree, as though she was a method actress. She manages to throw into the shadows an actor as forceful as Max von Sydow in their scenes together. Gunnar Bjornstrand is always great. He's uh, in two out of the films in this trilogy. He's, uh, of course, the leading part in Winterlight. And Minus, Lars Pashkor, was a theatre actor. And maybe we should emphasise just how important Bergman's relationship with theatre is, because that's where he has his team. Costume designers, production designers, actors. They act with him in the winter. And then in the summer, in those days, they would make a film together. So they knew each other intimately. And I think this always gives Bergman's performances that extra edge. Throughout the 50s, Bergman had definitely set up confrontations between uh, the artist figure, whether it was a magician in The Magician or uh, the knight in The Seventh Seal. Uh, there's always someone in his films who represents the artist, the entertainer, the filmmaker, whatever you like to call it. Um, uh, but in the trilogy, these oppositions become much starker. And... Uh, in Through a Glass Darkly, you get a very palpable sense that the writer, David, is an alter ego for Bergman and that Bergman himself feels guilty for having almost cannibalized his nearest and dearest and those he's worked with for his subject matter, for his material. And what he's saying is that it's almost died in the wool for the artist to do that. He has to do it. It's in his very nature. It's like the scorpion who stings a frog halfway across the river. And that is the nature of the artist. But that doesn't allow him to be forgiven easily. There's very little external religious discussion in uh, Through a Glass Darkly, except in the final sequence where the son asks uh, his father, you know, what is God, what's the meaning of God, and 
the Gunnabian Strand character tries to answer him and comes up with this rather pat description of God as love in all its forms. Uh, but I think the religious elements are there under the surface. And there's a very good scene when David, who comes home from Switzerland after a, an author tour and brings presents for the, all the family, but clearly there's a tension in the air because he's obviously been away too long and always goes away too long. And he realizes he's been a failure. He realizes also that, which we don't know at that point, that he's been exploiting his daughter's schizophrenia for his own next novel. He goes into the house to look for some tobacco and he starts sobbing and he holds his arms up as though he were on a, a crucifix. It's not too obvious, but it's there, the symbolism, if you want to, want to find it. So that's a typical example, I think, of how the religious undercurrent still goes through Bergman's work. And the whole point of the film is looking for God through family relations and trying to reconcile with your family and in so doing, uh, perhaps coming close to the nature of God on earth.